My Hero Academia is a shonen manga series serialized by Shonen Jump. It was created by Koei Horikoshi, whose previous notable works are Omagadoki Zoo and Barrage, both of which receiving an early cancellation due to not reaching the normal standards. Oh, boo-hoo! Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. Mr. Horikoshi then fell into depression, and as a final attempt at making a career for himself in this industry, he decided to create a manga based on a one-shot he made a long while back, while simultaneously taking inspiration from several popular media sources like Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, Star Wars, and Naruto. This then cultivated into the modern shonen sensation known as My Hero Academia. It follows the story of a small wimpy turd with a bush on his head for hair known as Izuku Midoriya. Aside from being really autistic, he also has a medical condition that makes his eyes spontaneously burst into tears every few minutes. <laughs> Will you stop crying? In a society where over 80% of the population have developed some sort of unique ability that they have termed as quirks, he is unfortunately part of the small percentage of society that did not develop a unique ability. Because of this, he is constantly bullied by nearly everyone around him because of his lack of superpowers. One of his biggest bullies is his childhood friend Bakugo Katsuki, a retarded screaming banshee who does nothing but act like your drunk father on Christmas to everyone around him. So obviously he's just desperately in love with Izuku. Am I right? Physical and mental abuse is the key to love, am I right? I bet you live in a very stable household. I love it. Let me sniff that little pussy so I can smell all the failure. But despite all these obstacles in his way, Midoriya is determined to overcome the odds and follow in the footsteps of his idol, All Might, and become the greatest hero of all time. Now, the question is, where do I come in all this? Well, for those of you who are new here, and I imagine there's quite a number of you, hi, I'm the pseudo intellectual, and I was once a huge fan of My Hero Academia. I I had read the manga since even before the anime was made. Admittedly, I didn't exactly get that far, and I had forgotten about it until the announcement of the show was made. After seeing the pilot episode, I proceeded to fall down a rabbit hole of consuming My Hero Academia content until I felt sick to my stomach. Although I fell behind quite a while back, there was a point in time when I was keeping up with the manga on a weekly basis. As for why that's no longer the case, well, you can take this video you're watching right now as the reason. The takeaway point you need right now is that I no longer have as much affection for this series as much as I used to. I sincerely believe that the story has greatly deteriorated over time, and as I went on to reread previous arcs, I started to notice more and more problems that I had been completely blind to until now. I'm not the only one with this opinion, mind you. Granted, if your only exposure to the critiquing side of the fandom is weekly reviews by chibi reviews and anime uproar, I'm not surprised you weren't aware of the negative press it's been building up. However, it's really not all that hard to find several video essays out there where people express genuine problems with the show. These YouTubers are the ones with actual things to say, and I truly do recommend when you check out some of these videos out. No offense to Chibi or Animac, I don't have anything personally against them, but their content has the least substance imaginable. Getting on a camera and just recapping the chapter while occasionally talking about how hyped you are is not what I'd call a helpful review, nor is it all that helpful to pull out your PNG avatar and just start spouting random bullshit. Oh my god, Deku breathed a certain way. Is this a death flag? This chapter is so freaking deep, guys. Oh my god, Deku just took a fucking shit is a symbolism for something. I digress though. This video was honestly a long time coming simply due to the fact that I made a tier list of the various different ships in My Hero Academia over a year ago. It's definitely my most popular video by a long shot, and I wouldn't be surprised a large portion of my current audience are here because of said video, so it's important to me that I set the record straight. I think My Hero Academia is an extremely flawed show, and I'm definitely not as big of a fan as I used to be. I have read the manga until chapter 290 at which point I nearly threw my phone across the room in a fit of frustration. I've tried pretty hard to keep my ill thoughts towards this series in check for quite some time now, but I can only keep silent for so long. I'm not saying you can't like it, by all means you do you. This video is simply me expressing my issues with the show. If you'd like to hear it, then welcome. If you don't want to hear criticisms and would prefer to continue blindly loving it, also fine. Feel free to leave a dislike on your way out. Maybe throw in a death threat at me in the comments as well. After all, you already did that several times to Horikoshi himself, am I right? As for you, Skip skeptics out there who cannot stand this show and have been grinding your teeth with spite ever since its rise in popularity, buckle up, I think you'll find this very amusing. Alright, enough bullshit, let's get started. お母さん、パソコン。また? <laughs>
Tells Endeavor that it was his own fire that just burned yet another starry-eyed kid with a bright future. This is a very meaningful statement from Dobby. I'd like to mention that there is no weak episode. Every arc from both the first and second seasons are well written and- Honestly, I saw people calling this chapter a little weak on Reddit and Twitter, but I think this was a great way to showcase the second battlefront. And you guys know I love all the girls in My Hero Academia, especially you, Toga. See him bend down the next page. You see the fucking hair, Brandy. The fucking hair just broke. Oh my god. The fucking hair. Demon Slayer to me is solid. It's just, but, it's, but so is My Hero Academia. Like, it's it's just another solid show. But yeah, to be fair, if if I can't, I, I I would rather watch Demon Slayer than My Hero Academia. No, same, same. Annoying is there a tournament on? Deku was always annoying. He was annoying from episode one, season one. I fucking hate Deku. He's it literally the one. on me the hype that I had, and I've been aggressively been caring about it less and less. I award My Hero Academia with the rating of certified frosty. A rating only for the best of the best. Oh shit. Oh day, pray them niggas go away. Oh we sell the clowns around it look like circus solid. This is not the album either. These are just some doughs. This is still so cold when it dropped it's gonna be a motherfucking snow day. Before we get to the main crux of the issues regarding the plot, let's first talk about a concept known as world building. World building is defined as the process of constructing an imaginary world, sometimes associated with a fictional universe. Depending on the type of story you are trying to write, this part of storytelling can either be very easy or extremely difficult if you don't already have a good idea on what kind of world your characters are residing in. Stories like Lord of the Rings and The Witcher take place in a world that is 100% fictional with its own style of civilization, race, and cultures. These kinds of settings are often a lot more difficult to construct, but it's without a doubt the most flexible and fun way to do world building, as it offers a lot more room for creative brainstorming. It gives you plenty of leeway to come up with your own concepts and rules, but you have to make sure those rules are well defined and properly established or else you'll end up with a situation where plot holes are pretty much around every corner because you yourself don't seem to understand the rules of your own world. Not that I'm pointing any fingers or anything. Another method of world building would be the alternate earth format. I did not come up with that name, I stole it from world and the alternate Earth world building is basically you taking our version of Earth, our modern society, and adding a few original elements to it for the sake of building your story. Take the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for example. Obviously, there's no billionaire scientist going around dressed up in an Iron Man combat suit, but all the events of that movie took place in our world. Not Mobius, not Middle Earth, not some unknown planet called the Globe, just normal Earth. This kind of world building is easier in a sense because all the foundations foundations are already laid out for you, but it also gives you a lot more constrictions as you have to abide by the rules already established in our society. If you want to make the environment feel alive, then the world has to react to all these supernatural elements you are putting into it. If monsters or some strange creatures start roaming the earth and start killing people, then you better shape society into a way that reflects that. For example, in God Eater, monsters known as the Aragami started roaming the earth, and to combat them, scientists took pieces of the origami itself, made it into a weapon, and then started finding people who are compatible with the monster's DNA so that they can turn them into super soldiers. It went from a completely normal society to a post-apocalyptic one. That is the world reacting to supernatural elements added by the writer. That is the alternate Earth method of world building, and this is one of the reasons why the whole spectacle of the MCU got really ridiculous to me. Are you seriously telling me after all these attacks on the cities the government have not built some sort of defense mechanism in the likely event of an alien attack or something? Are they really content with just leaving it to the superheroes when S.H.I.E.L.D. have shown on multiple occasions that they are incompetent and the Avengers do just as much if not more damage than the villains? And don't even get me started on the DC Universe, Gotham is a fucking shithole. But this whole place sucks! I am honestly surprised every government on Earth hasn't decided to cut their losses and just bomb it off the face of the Earth. Also, side note, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a stupid ass show. No, I will not elaborate. My personal vendetta against Marvel and DC aside, this is probably the most bare-bones explanation of what world building is you could probably get. Basically, you can just build your entire story setting from scratch, or you can just take our boring world and just add some pizzazz to it. If you want to learn more about world building and would like a more in-depth explanation, then I once again point to World Anvil's video about the subject. It's a pretty good watch. But back to the series. Hiro Aka uses the second format of world building, as in everything takes place in an alternate universe where over 80% of the population has superpowers. Now, 
contrary to what you might believe, I'll be the first to admit that My Hero Academia's pilot episode was actually pretty damn good. The very first scene opens up on a sunny day in Japan. The next shot is of a crying little boy who was obviously scared shitless, but he still refuses to move out of the way as he's trying to protect the kid behind him. We then cut to three other children who are obviously bullies, before all of them reveal that they have superhuman abilities without anybody batting an eye. The leader of the bullies says the green-haired kid's name, before they promptly beat the two of them up. As Deku lays down on the floor in pain and shame, a narration of an older version of himself starts talking. Here's the sad truth. All men are not created equal. When I was four years old, I learned that some kids have more power than others. Now let's take a moment to evaluate everything we just went through in one full picture. One, it establishes two central characters. Deku also makes a good first impression since we now know he's the type to protect others over himself. It is a bit of a cliche coming from a shonen protagonist, but that doesn't change the fact that it's a positive trait. Two, it shows that this world has supernatural properties to it without outright saying it. Instead, it uses visual storytelling and a simple word, quirk. Three, it sets up the theme for the story in the form of a quote, not all men are created equal. What do you know? It's got all the aspects that an introduction to a story is supposed to have, and it's presented in a pretty interesting way. Good job, this scene gets full marks. The rest of the episode is pretty good too. It spends majority of the first half explaining the origins of quirks and how society has evolved around the phenomenon. It expands further on the main character as well, letting us know about his goals as well as showing us the struggles he has to go through due to the handicap he was born with. One of those obstacles just so happens to be his rival, who was the bully from his childhood. It does a pretty good job of portraying Deku to be sympathetic, and at first, I really wanted to root for him. This was a kid who, in a world of superhumans, had nothing to his name besides being a hero nerd. Despite that, he still intends to try and enter his dream school because he really wants to help people. A very naive but respectable mindset. His naivety was put on full display when we were shown just how powerless he is when he's attacked by a sludge villain who almost cut the story short. If All Might hadn't been around the area, Izuku would have fucking died. Simple as that. The episode ends off on a really suspenseful note with Izuku asking All Might if it's possible for him to become a hero without a quirk before cutting to the ending song, leaving the viewers eagerly waiting for what was to come. I'll preface again by saying I really do think the pilot was good. It does everything it's meant to do which was set up the foundation of the setting and characters while simultaneously getting us invested by doing it in an interesting way. It was, overall, a very solid first impression, and I'll always stand by that. However, my main problems with the show start to sprout as early as the next episode after this, so let's go through it, shall we? Episode 2 starts off well enough with the secret of All Might coming to light when he loses all of his muscle mass and reverts back to a zombie-like body. It's a pretty funny scene. <laughs> For the sake of context a bit later on, I should probably mention that in the beginning there was a scene with Bakugo and his two friends. It's really just a whatever scene. Bakugo was already portrayed as a complete psychopath in the previous episode. This really does nothing but just hammer in the fact just how much Izuku lives rent free in his head just by existing. He's captured by the sludge monster because it fell out of All Might's pocket when Deku grabbed him. And that's the setup. Back to the roof. All Might then proceeds to tell Deku about the harsh reality of a hero, i.e. a life full of danger where you're constantly putting your life on the line for others. Throughout this entire sequence, All Might speaks from a sympathetic but straightforward perspective. As much as he'd like to tell the kid that he could be a hero despite his lack of power, he would simply be lying. I am fully in agreement with All Might in this case, and the show pretty much confirms later on that what he was saying was true. After giving him a thorough lecture, he tells Deku that if he really wants to help people so badly, then he can become a cop or something. He leaves Deku with some final words of advice. It's not bad to have a dream, young man. Just make sure your dreams are attainable. Realistic. Now, this scene as a whole is actually pretty okay. It gives us a decent perspective of just what kind of character All Might is, and gives us a glimpse on the kind of weight hanging on his shoulders. It also serves to, again, inform us that the hero job isn't all it's cracked up to be. And I appreciate the mature choice they took by not just blindingly encouraging Deku to recklessly follow his dreams. He is a powerless child in a world where guys could easily create a blast big enough to level a stadium. There is very little chance of him surviving on the front lines, and I really really wish they kept up with this narrative. If there's one complaint I have about this scene though, it's that All Might was just gonna let Deku walk away when he now knows about his condition. I know that he never spills any nitty gritty details such as his fight with All For One, but they make it such a big point in later episodes that absolutely no one should know about All Might's condition that I find it baffling that he was just walking away with absolutely nothing to make sure Deku won't spew out his secret other than his word. It might have been a good idea to phone up Tsukauchi at that moment to have Deku maybe sign an NDA or something more concrete to keep his mouth shut. Hey, 
Hey, All Might, what's up? Uh, yeah, Sigochi. Don't ask why, but I kind of just spilled my secret to some random kid. Wait, what? The rest of the episode is, uh... Yeah, it's not good, honestly. We cut to a scene of the slush monster causing mayhem in the middle of town, with several heroes chipping in to try and rescue a captured Bakugo. A lot of them are shown to be pretty worthless for the current situation, or just useless in general. Instead of, like, evacuating the area, the civilians are kind of just standing around and watching. Even the police aren't doing much. Instead of telling everyone to fuck off, they're just saying, stay behind the line, as if that's gonna do anything. But what really makes this whole sequence of events just borderline retarded is when all Might shows up to the scene and he just fucking gives up. No joke, All Might sees what's happening, gets intense pain from his injuries, and then just decides there's nothing he can do. He was about to just let Bakugo die. Now let's go over a few things. All Might has been in the hero business for literally years. He is the strongest hero in the entire world. The symbol of peace. The entire point of his character is to be a figure of justice that sends fear into the hearts of villains with just the mention of his name. And for the most part, the story remains consistent with that narrative. They paint him as having a strong sense of justice. He always wants to do the right thing no matter what. This is proven as early as when he's unable to attend class because he spent too much time helping people on the way to school that he's now unable to retain his muscle form for majority of that day. And judging from flashbacks, he has always been like this. His desire to become an immovable wall of justice goes as far back to when he first meets his mentor, where he voices that he wants to be a hero so great he can help literally everyone. A person with this kind of conviction would never, ever just sit back and let someone die. His ideals would never allow him to do that. He would sooner throw himself in front of the crossfire before he let that happen. His previous sidekick, Sir Nidai, who has a quirk that lets him see one's future, literally begged with All Might to retire or else he will die horribly. What does All Might do? He ignores his advice and keeps pushing forward. Do you understand now why I find the idea of All Might just looking down sadly and deciding to let Bakugo die to be fucking stupid? It was just a convenient way to give Deku the spotlight. Oh come on, Mr. Pseudo Intellectual, you saw it earlier in the episode. All Might is a realist. Besides, jumping in without a plan is just stupid. No one in their right mind would ever do that. It's just plain dumb. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I first saw this scene, I actually thought the moment when Deku jumped into danger was actually a good scene. And if anything, I still find the setup to this moment pretty decent. After the reality check from All Might, Deku was seen slowly giving up on his dream. And honestly, who could blame him? He spent his entire life up to that point with everyone calling him a failure. Even his own mother doubted him, so having his idol also tell him to give up was the final nail in the coffin. When he sees the carnage, he thinks back to what happened with All Might and realizes how badly he screwed up. It makes him sick to his stomach. He He's regretful. He's absolutely distraught, but all he can do is stand back and silently apologize. He's learned his place. He knew he was completely useless in this scenario. But when he sees Bakugo, the biggest bully in his life, trapped within the depths of a monster he indirectly helped to escape, he breaks. As he jumps in, I expected him to use his wide range of knowledge of superheroes to intelligently come up with a way to find the villain's weakness. It was hinted at the very beginning that he was pretty smart, so it had enough setup. But what does he do? He throws his bag and just starts pulling on the sludge like a fucking retard. I don't fucking care how he feels. If this is all he came up with, if this is all he was capable of, this was a stupid decision to make. You're missing the point, dude. It wasn't meant to show his capabilities, it was meant to show he has the heart of a hero. No! Kinda contradicting yourself there, buddy, because we just established earlier that if All Might jumped into the danger while knowing he couldn't use his muscle form, it would be a stupid idea. Again, it wouldn't be out of character, but a stupid decision nonetheless. So he smartly decides not to do that, because being competent is also part of being a hero. Yet Deku, in all his heroic glory, decides to jump knowing full well he couldn't do anything, and he's a hero? Bullshit. I think reckless and idiotic would be better words for what he did. If All Might hadn't been inspired to push through his injuries, both Deku and Bakugo would have died for nothing. And I wouldn't be so harsh on this scene if Deku wasn't rewarded for what he did. Sure, he got a bit of a lecture from the other heroes there, but after this whole debacle was settled, All Might decides that this boy is the right decision to inherit one for all. This fucking moron who very well nearly just jumped into his own death was the one he decides to bestow his godlike strength to. Not 
only does Deku getting one for all destroy any sense of mystery as to how he's going to become the number one hero, but I'm gonna say it, I don't think he deserves it. In my humble opinion, I think it would have been better if All Might just acknowledged Deku instead of just spoon feeding him the solution to all his problems. So, as an example of how I would write these events, remove Deku running in like an idiot and have him come up with an actual plan. Maybe he could yell out orders to the pro heroes about a possible weakness the villain might have, or maybe have him come up with a strategy that puts their quirks to best use for the given situation. Maybe you could have him reveal that he has some sort of secret invention that he made with the purpose of helping him fight better. Just something to make him seem more competent than just Leroy! After that, have All Might meet up with him later and have him give Deku a few words of encouragement. It doesn't have to be anything extravagant, just something to show that Deku has convinced him to have a slight change of heart. Hey kid, what you did was extremely dangerous, damn near suicidal even, and yet despite not having a quirk, you still managed to help beat the villain. You've got heart, maybe, just maybe, you can become a hero. And then he leaves. He doesn't give Deku one for all, he doesn't become Deku's personal mentor, he just walks away. Not only do I think this would be a more realistic development, but it also opens up a whole new world of possibilities as Deku would have to get much more creative if he ever wanted to achieve his dreams. I'm not the first one to bring up this idea, there's been tons and tons of people who stated they would have preferred to have something different than Deku being given All Might's quirk, and I completely agree with them, it was a waste of an opportunity. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, this is always going to be nothing but fan fiction. The next few episodes of the first season were alright, but not nearly as solid as the way it started. A large amount of the things that occurred throughout the rest of the season do leave me questioning some of the rules of this world though. Admittedly, Season 1 had the least amount of questionable world building choices, but one of the biggest flaws within the first season is closely related to Bakugo. Okay, so here's the thing. Bakugo's behavior in the very early stages of this show is extremely fucking horrendous. I'll save my overview and thoughts about his character and development later on. For now, I just want to focus on the way he acted and the general lack of consequences he faces for his actions. Listen, Bakugo is one of the better characters in this series. However, I do think Horikoshi went a bit bit too extreme with his character in the beginning. This raging faggot tried to assault Deku during the first day of class, and then tried to murder him the very next day. I've heard the many excuses people have made, such as Bakugo didn't actually kill him so it's fine, or Bakugo wasn't actually trying to kill him, he purposely missed the shot. And to that I say, shut the fuck up. He blew a fucking hole through the training area, and him missing the shot wasn't guaranteed to not kill Deku with that big of an explosion. It shouldn't matter if he thought he had the entire thing under control, he still did something that could potentially murder a classmate. Oh, I'm sorry, Teach. I only threw an explosion when there was no one inside the classroom, so it should be okay, right? Teach, chill. I wasn't actually trying to kill him. I was just swinging a massive fucking knife in his general direction. I knew he would dodge it. All Might or literally any of the other teachers should have taken note of the fact that this kid had a few fucking screws loose and do something about him. Not saying he should have been expelled, but do more than just give him a slap on the wrist for God's sakes. Put him in a timeout. Call his parents. Have a one-on-one -on -one counsel counseling session with him or something, you quite literally just let him get away with attempted murder scot-free. And that's really one of the biggest issues with this show, the lack of consequences. How many times has Bakugo acted out like this and they treated it as a gag or just quirky Bakugo things and not give him a serious sit down? Aizawa keeps threatening them with consequences but never follows through with it. Even when he does punish them, it's usually with inconsequential shit like detention or extra homework. Yue truly lives up to its name of being a high maintenance in school with the top-of-the-line security. They truly proved their strictness with all the times the students have disobeyed their teacher's orders and have nothing happened to them. Few examples so it doesn't look like I'm making empty statements here. As mentioned before, Bakugo nearly fucking murdering Midoriya. Ida putting everybody in danger by going off to fight Stain and received no punishment. Midoriya and his crew disobeying teacher's orders and running off to rescue Bakugo anyway. This event is especially fucking bullshit to me. Oh, but dude, they did get punished. They received a scolding. If Bakugo wasn't saved, they would have been Spelled. whoop de fucking do you stupid shit. That's not enough. Seriously, the number of times Deku puts himself in danger because of his own self-righteous fucking ego should have been enough to kick this retard out. They are responsible with keeping these kids safe, and I don't know about you, but if I was a UA staff in this scenario, I'd rather just boot them from the program rather than let them eventually get themselves killed because they can't learn to step aside and let the adults do their job. Or if you're not gonna expel them, then at least do more than just give them a fucking tongue lashing. Do you really think a 
little Electro with a threatening face will stop them from pulling shit like this again? No, the answer is no, it wouldn't. This show just can't seem to grasp the concept of effective punishment. The closest thing we got to an impactful form of consequence was when Midoriya was put at a risk of never being able to use his arms again, so he needed to stop casually breaking them. Another instance of impactful consequence was when Mario had to lose his quirk in order to protect Eri, but of course if you're a manga reader, you'd know that both of these instances don't matter anymore. This is all your fault! This pattern of the show trying its absolute best to avoid any sort of serious repercussion for the character's actions is a reoccurring issue that continues to cripple this show to this very day. Now that we've covered the main things that affect the story as a whole, we're now going to be examining individual aspects of this series that I find very, very flawed. Starting with the power system. At least that's the plan for the next part. Tune in next time as I cover extensively on the power system of My Hero Academia, as well as elaborate on some of my thoughts on certain characters in this well-overblown cast. You don't want to miss it. Ah! And they don't stop coming and they don't